So welcome to today's the new IT goals meetup with Checky here. Uh, about today, I will talk briefly about the new IT goals and our vision. Afterwards, Checky will talk about uh, sending passwords on postcards. I'm very, very uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. And afterwards, if you are interested, you can stay in the call and we can do a little bit of networking and talk about the talk or other things. Um, yeah, so I will start today with our goal. The new IT girls were founded around two years ago. Our goal is, is, is to show the diversity in the IT field, also to show um, the positive impact of women in tech. And this goal we like to reach together in the community. And for that, um, currently we have the goal, um, we have we support around 1,000 women. Until 2025, we like to support and empower 10,000 women um, in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. So um, this all can be reached just with, uh, with you on our side and with your help. And um, for those who don't know us, um, we are a community based here in Vienna and had uh, talks since 2019 around different topics. Um, a lot of those topics were on um, female leadership or around women in tech in general. And um, so our community focus on different or on a broad IT job title description. So we have uh, developers, we have AI specialists, we do have, um, as I am, I'm a consultant uh, specialized on Microsoft technologies, and we do also uh, support women around um, marketing and, and P, uh, PR in who are related to uh, technology or work in the IT industry as well. So very broad um, field here. And with the new series, which is doing um, Jackie now the next three months, uh, we like to give um, our communities more a uh, technical perspective as well. And so this is why Jackie is here today with her expertise as well. And yeah, for doing such um, broad meetups, we need your help and your support. So what you can do is uh, to apply your ideas and your sessions via a forum. Um, it's available here on this website as well. And yeah, we like to, we are happy to see new ideas uh, and new uh, talks here in this list. And maybe you're one of the next speakers here with the new IT girls. Um, if you like, you can all please share your LinkedIn profile. Um, and connect with us. Um, I'm Doris Schlaffer, by the way. I, th I forgot to introduce myself today. Uh, I'm Doris Schlaffer, one of the founders of the New IT Girls. Astrid Wieland is the second founder of the New IT Girls. And Christina Maria Brandstetter is our communication expert here in, and board member with the New IT Girls. So please feel free to connect with me and to with the others. Share your LinkedIn profile, please. And yeah, together we will, yeah, we will reach our goal for the 10,000 women till 2025. And also, in very important, yeah, of course, we have a website, but we have uh, also a closed LinkedIn group um, where you can uh, join the community. Um, we also have an open uh, company page there. Here you can follow the information. This is uh, very interesting for sponsors. We do have sponsors as well. Um, all our meetups uh, are on yeah, meetup and we do have some uh, social media channels like Instagram and Twitter. So if you like to support us, please use our hashtags and yeah. 
I think uh, this is the last thing I like to talk about today. It's regarding sponsors. We do have sponsors like the Austrian Institute of Technology and uh, Evernate, and we are always looking for company sponsors who support our missions. So if you know companies who like to support our missions, then please feel to please feel free to contact us. And yeah, we will talk with them or with you directly regarding how they can support us. And now I will hand over, after this briefly introduction of my side, I will hand over to Jackie. Um, and regarding to, to her very awesome talk, I think, because the title is awesome. So <laughs> it's your turn, Jackie. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so I would share my screen here. Yeah, I hope you see it now because I can't uh, because I'm using not at the moment. Not, yeah, now it's here. Because I'm using uh, Microsoft, the Microsoft Teams app, but on Linux, and that's always Microsoft and Linux is uh, still on a on a rocky path towards a more solid relationship, I would say. Um, yeah. So um, without further ado, I, I just open the chat window in case you want to ask me something during the talk also. Maybe I can take a look. Um, welcome to my talk on, on, on with the title Sending Passwords on Postcards, How the Internet Works and the Basics of Secure Communication. Um, this is a talk based on, on a talk we have been developing uh, in context of the Giving.it Collective. Um, and the, the slides are also online now on this link. I'll share it in the chat. So if if you want to look something up, you can do that live or also later, so you can come back to the slides. I hope that works. Yes. So I will go. I will go full screen now. Um, so what what will the talk be about? First of all, I want to give you some insights into the Internet basics, how how the whole thing works. Um, then I will talk about secure communication through the internet uh, and how to protect the data, how to increase your privacy and, and what metadata and tracking is all about. And I will also probably shortly touch on, on trust on the internet and, sec and secure software, depending on how much time we have left in the end. Um, and in the end, I will also give some tips and advice some easy, easy things you can do to increase your privacy and security. Um, and hopefully we still have time to discuss a little bit of that. Um, and, and first of all, this talk is not an inspirational talk. It's a mostly foundational talk because it's really about the basics. Um, and also as in the announcement, uh, we already stated that, uh, that uh, it is the very basic thing. So if you are a developer, you might know some of those things, but I still hope that, that there is something new. And despite not being inspirational in nature, but more foundational, I still hope the talk will inspire you to, to be more aware about your communication and about your privacy and what you can do about that. So let's jump in. First of all, with some interactivity. Uh, well, it's not really an internet so that early on, but. Nevertheless, I would like um, you to answer some questions. And for that, uh, I would like you to go to slido.com. Uh, it's a, it's a, like probably you know Mentimeter or something. It's a live polling system. Um, you don't have to uh, participate at, at the moment, but I really would appreciate it if you provide some answers. Uh, you go there and then you have a, 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 a bow a input field where you can enter this uh, this hash or yeah, this number, this ID, um, and then some numbers will pop, uh, questions will pop up. I also post it in the chat because I'll. The doc gets lost. Gets lost. So yeah, now you have the, the link or the domain and the, the ID here. So I'll start the poll. Uh, the first question is, to which decade can the origins of today's internet be traced back? And 
here we'll see how many answers we already have, and then I should also show the, the results. Okay, eight answers so far. Let's wait one, a few more seconds. Maybe somebody wants to join in. Around 1970s. Yeah, okay. Probably everybody knows that by the 1980s, internet was already a thing. Um, most common people maybe just started to use it in the 1990s, but the development of the internet happened much earlier. And actually, it, it was starting in the 1960s, uh, in the late 1960s. I will talk about that a bit more. I just wanted to get a bit of a feeling um, what your grasp is on that. So let's jump to the next question. Do you know the difference between between HTTP and HTTPS? Okay, mo most of you already know that. That's good. Um, but it's also good that not all of you already know it, because otherwise parts of my talk wouldn't make sense, probably. But let, let's get to the next question. You know the difference between HTTP and HTTPS, uh, but the next question is a bit more nuanced, maybe. Um, what does HTTPS stand for? And I think here you can answer with, uh, you can provide different answers or se several answers. Um, and you could type in what the acronym stands for, but you could also type in what what it actually is. And and I, I wanted to ask those questions in the beginning uh, so that I have a bit of a feeling of how your perspective on this topic already is and, and where where I should elaborate more or less maybe. Let's see what we already have. The hypertext transfer protocol secure, yes, that is exactly the, what the acronym stands for. The HTTP and the S for secure. Yes, exactly. So, so you all got that quite, quite well already. It's about when we when we retrieve uh, hypertext, basically websites, to to do it on a secure channel. While HTTP itself is not a secure channel, and we'll we will see why that is. And one last question: Do you know the difference between circuit switching and packet switching? That's, that's also good, so so I actually can tell you something new. Okay, then I will close the poll for now. And now we'll dive into, into the basics and what the thing does there the packet switching, the circuit switching, and HTTP and HTTPS. So, um, first of all, I, I want to talk, talk, tell you a little bit about um, how the internet started and how it grew, um, and then about what packet switching actually is, uh, and some technical terms that that um, around all the time and and um, maybe you already know them, but we'll shortly look into, into what they do, which are IP, MAC, and DNS. And I also have a concrete example of what actually happens when I visit a website. Um, I also have something about protocols and what happens when I encrypt an email, but we'll probably not go into that yet in the talk. If we in the end have a lot more time left and, and you are very curious, then we can still look into that. So. What's the history of the internet? And I, I termed it 
as one history because depending on where you are in, in, in time and region, there might be different perspectives on how the internet developed because actually it's an it's a interconnected set of networks, of many different networks, um, but that's the probably the dominant perspective on the history of the internet, which was initially developed. Um, what was it developed for? Was it developed for communication, for fun and freedom? Actually not, as many uh, awesome civic technology we enjoy now. Uh, or originally, it was a military development, um, uh, developed in the Cold War by the APRA, or the Defense APRA, which is the Advanced Research Projects Agen Agency of the US, USA. Uh, and this first, in basically, this first internet, or the first part of the internet, was the ARPANET. Um, and what was the basic idea when it was not to create something that we all can use for fun and freedom? Uh, the idea was to create a packet switch network with automatic route selection, redundant routes, and then shortly explain what it means in order to remain intact uh, nationwide, even in the event of an atomic bomb uh, attack on individual cities. Like it was the Cold War period. And uh, people thought, okay, what happens when a, 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 an atomic bomb hits a city, which is a big communication hub? Um, and for, for the rest of the country to be still be able to communicate, uh, there, there was this need to, uh, for a packet switch network um, that can circumvent uh, uh, basically when a central node uh, goes down. But it was not only in this context, but also to, to enable resource sharing for faster scientific progress. And, and I tell that this only because I think it is important to know where things come from and that we cannot take certain things for granted or cannot always take certain things for granted when, when we are now communicating from, from everywhere with everyone we want to communicate with about everything we want to communicate with. This basically was a side effect uh, and it's still always changing the, the way we can use the internet and we have some agency in, in that. So, you know, probably one of these pictures or from early films, the, the, the phrase, hello operator. Um, this was when you, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when you wanted to phone someone. Uh, you took up your phone and then you said, hello operator, please, could you connect me to person X or Y. And the operators have been uh, mostly uh, women sitting in front of these switchboards, and they were responsible for actually creating the connection between uh, your phone and and target phone, maybe, or to another operator center where somebody connects it to another target. Because in the time when you call somebody, throughout your call, there had, had to be a, a, a physical connection from your phone, uh, uh, like electric circuit, un, until the other phone, phone. If it was through, over the whole continent, there still had to be one connection throughout the whole call. And this mode of communication doesn't scale very well. And that was why we needed a packet switching network. And here's a graphic uh, a map of the ARPANET in 1969, when they actually started experimenting, or they started experimenting a little bit earlier, but that was basically the, the foundation of the internet, where they had four research institutes. Um, do you, by the way, do you see my mouse pointer? I'm just not sure, so. Yes, we do. Okay, so here you see those four research institutes at the, at the west coast of the USA, um, and they had nodes like for computers that have been connected in this network and this idea uh, uh, and the network quickly grew so one year later sorry one year later uh, there have been already several other research institutes connected on the west coast and also some on the east coast and the idea was with with packet switching that you have different connections and you can use all of them interchangeably so while when when in the old phone system you had to have this one line that has to hold throughout the whole call um, where an operator was sitting at all the exchange nodes and, and switching the switchboards 
um, now with packet switching, the idea was to take the information you want to send and package it into small packets. Like you have a data stream and you cut it up into, for example, 10 packets. And every packet you can send to the destination about over any possible path. Like if the first packet goes here, the next packet could actually go here. The important thing is that in the end, all the packets arrive. And so even if one node goes down, you still could communicate and the whole information would be received at the end and could be sent back. So that is the basic idea of packet switching. Only three years later, it, it grew even more. And here we already have a satellite connection to Hawaii and to NORSA, which uh, connected to London. So NORSA was in Norwegian, uh, in, Norwegian, in Norway, sorry. So it was a Norwegian research institute. And that's basically the time when Europe got connected to this ARPANET. Uh, and today it actually looks more like that. Um, and when we have a close up, we see many nodes that are connected in, in one more local network. And these in turn are connected to a bigger network. And all of them are connected to some sort of global network. And it's quite hard or actually nowadays impossible to have a perspective or a full view of the whole internet. Just one more map. Um, this is the undersea uh, network, I think around the uh, 2000s or something. Um, and these are just cables that are in the Atlantic Ocean connecting connecting Europe, Africa, and North and South America. Um, so you see there is already a lot of connections going on. And if some connections break, still the others are up and uh, create a reliable means of communication for us. And below the, if you if you revisit the, the, the slides later, um, you always have the sources for those uh, maps. And this is actually a quite nice one because they have a lot of more maps uh, showing how the internet uh, was established and grew also up until now. So what was the development before 2000? Um, in 1973, the first standards for the definition of email as we know them today have been created. So how an email looks like, what's the content, um, basically we still use the same thing today. Um, 1981 was the first SMTP standard. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol and that's basically the protocol for sending emails still in use today. There have been adaptations. Um, but you see, it was developed in 1981. Back then, they didn't have a problem with spam. So that's also the reason why there is so much spam, because uh, when they designed the protocols, this wasn't really an issue. Um, what happened also in 1981 was that the, the research expansion um, led to the CSNet connecting to the ARPANET. So it was not only this one network where already many different research institutions have been, but a different kind of network that was connected to the first kind of network. And in 1986, uh, the NSF net uh, also connected. Um, to manage all those increasingly hard to, to, to control um, and to overview uh, connections of, of different networks, there had to be a, a, a good protocols, and that's when the TCP/IP protocol stack formed in 1982. And this is something you probably also have heard: TCP or IP. That's still the, the basic protocols uh, that we are use that, that we or our computers are using today to communicate globally. And then in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the first commercial ISPs that are internet service providers uh, came about in, in Austria. We have been a bit uh, late in the late 1990s. Um, that's when, when also basically uh, common people like probably like us uh, uh, went on the internet before it was usually just research institutions and big companies like uh, banks. Uh, that already had access and used it for, for their business model. Um, 
and, and it also brought about new business models, of course, when everybody joined in the internet. In 1990, uh, this ARPANET, the original uh, network, and research network, was decommissioned. So by then, basically, the internet didn't look anything like it had looked in the beginning. And there was uh, just a connection of many different uh, network segments that have been managed by many different organizations. So there was no single, there's no single entity that actually can control um, all the flow of information. And I've already told you about the, the maps uh, on this box site. I find them really nice. Uh, so if you're interested in maps and the history of the internet, um, take a look at those. They're really nice to look at and also informative. So now for the heavy stuff. IP, MAC and DNS, what does it mean? Um, our computers are locally addressed by a MAC address. They have to have some kind of, for example, if I am in my, my home network or in the office network, and there are also other computers all connecting to the network, they have to have some kind of identifier to, to be able to address themselves. And these are the MAC addresses, and you probably have already seen them. Uh, that's what computers use locally. On the global scale, computers use IP addresses, and these look like this. And so on the on the basically on the border from my local network to the to the internet, um, some of translation has to happen. Um, I mean, my computer has also an IP address, but sometimes locally they, they can be reused uh, and and be not public. But as soon as I connect to the broader internet, some computer has to have a public IP address that is reachable globally. So this IP address from wherever I connect to the internet, I can reach always the same computer as long as the computer has this address. Um, but the problem with those addresses is, of course, that uh, they are quite bad or quite uh, uncomfortable for us humans to remember, and that is why the DNS system has been developed. Um, and the DNS system translates domain names to IP addresses. So, for example, uh, if I have a domain like dbin.at, um, usually I type that in into some browser or somewhere, and the computer automatically translates it into the IP address, which is actually used to communicate. And to do this translation, we have this DNS system. And there are also services in the internet um, which provide this service. Here, just see what I did manually um, in my terminal. Uh, just ask the system what is actually the address for this uh, domain. Uh, and it gave me back this IP address. And it also told me something else. It told me that all mail for this domain, for example, Jackie at dbin.it, will be handled by a server known as mail.dbin.it. This again can, could have the same IP address or, or another one. So it could be a different server. So what now happens when I visit a website? Um, first of all, I enter a domain name, let's say dbin.it, into my browser and hit return. So the first browser, first of all, has to ask the DNS system, hey, what's the IP address of uh, dbin.it? And uh, the browser has to wait until it gets a valid response. Uh, and the DNS re response usually will say there, uh, the IP address is, in this case, 176.9.22.182. And with that information, the browser uh, sends the first request packet through the internet to the IP address uh, that it got back. Um, and at this IP address, a, a, a separate application, it's called the web server, is listening for incoming packets. And when it receives it, the web server returns, um, first of all, it receives it and analyzes it, and then it returns uh, the response. Um, because the server says, yes, uh, on, my, on my hard drive somewhere, I have the files for dbin.it. It also may have files for other uh, websites, but in this case, dbin.it was requested, and so the web server sends back the website content as a response. And usually the response can be more than one packet. Um, it depends on the size. If I have really a small um, index page just consisting of a little bit of text, it might actually only just need one response packet. 
but if it's something bigger like a picture or even like a screencast or recording of a, of a talk, then of course the, the whole thing would be split it in, in many smaller packages and the packets uh, will be transmitted back as response packets. So when they receive, uh, when they come back, my computer receives all the packages and assembles them according to this TCP IP protocol. And when everything is here and put into the original order again, uh, then uh, this protocol stack or the, the network stack in my computer hands all the data back to my web browser. And only then my browser shows me the response in the form of the website, for example, or by starting a, playing a video or whatever I've requested. So this is basically happening all the time when I visit some website or access a, a video over the web or even when I use um, instant messaging, for example, or a, a web app for a messenger, for example, signal or whatever. And here I want to give you a visualized look on, on what happens here. Um, and here we have my notebook. And I want to access this uh, debian.it. So my notebook is connected to my wireless router. And this wireless router is somehow connected to this vast cloud of interconnected connected networks, which we call the internet. And somewhere in the internet, um, there's also a server that is connected to it. And that's actually the server with this IP address that is responsible for handling the website for debian.it. So when we remove the cloud, we will see a lot of uh, different, actually they are just computers, very specialized computers, which are called routers, um, because they are just responsible for receiving packages and sending out packages on, on another line. Some routers have two connections or three or more that could be quite different. So the first router is maybe from my internet service provider, and this again is connected to other internet service providers and they in turn are connected to maybe a backbone and uh, somehow they can reach the, the final destination, which is a, a, maybe a university or other organization where the server stands and is connected to a, a network switch, for example. So the thing I told before the sequence will look how this plays out here in this internet, actually, in this connected set of networks. First of all, we said we have to send a request packet, and that goes to my wireless router, to my internet service provider, and the first router then just decides, based on whatever uh, reasons uh, that is configured really usually, usually um, which path to take. So it just says, okay, I'll send it here to this router, because it's the most direct or the cheapest uh, route or the fastest, whatever. And it some, somehow the packet uh, is received by the web server then. And then we said the web server re uh, resends or resp responds with a response, response packet. And this might be sent through the same route back here. But also what might happen is that this router says for any reason, okay, no, I won't send it here because for some reason now this route is faster, for example. But it doesn't matter to me because in the end the packet uh, is retrieved. And if I get more responses, the next packet could go through a different route, completely different route here. Again, it doesn't matter for me because my computer uh, makes sure that, or the TCP IP protocol in my computer makes sure that all packages are assembled in the right order and presented to my web browser. Uh, the important thing here is that there are already many, many routers uh, that are involved in this communication of a single network, uh, single website request, let's say. And for example, this router actually sees all the packets that go in and go out. Uh, and so whoever controls this route, and we usually don't know, we also don't have to know and we don't have to care, um, but whoever controls the router or whoever is able to hack the router to control it uh, might also read whatever is going in and out of here. And that's the, the reason why we have to secure our communication. 
So that's what we have protocols for to make sure that all of that works. And I won't go into detail about that, um, but just the, the things you might already have heard, the HTTP protocol, which we use to retrieve uh, web content and hypertext, um, the SMTP and IMAP are for sending emails and retrieving emails, and there are lots of other protocols. An important thing, a protocol is just a convention used by different parties, like computers in this case, to communicate with each other. And uh, the definition of how the con or the, the actual transmission should look like uh, often uses a text format. Basically, it's just sending text over the net. And whoever can read the text can do whatever they want with it. Not, not according to the law, of course, but uh, that's a different point. So how does it look to actually speak HTTP? Um, here I did something usually my web browser does for me. Um, I used the Telnet program to connect to dbin.at on port 80. And this is also a convention. This is the port a web server is listening for unencrypted uh, content usually. And the Telnet program does nothing else than waiting for input from me and sending it to the destination and everything it gets back, it prints out to me. The only thing it did before, it already translated by using the DNS system, the domain name into the IP. So I just typed into this Telnet program, get slash HTTP 1.1 host dbin.it and then I hit enter or edit one, one empty line. And that was sent to the server and actually told the server because it's defined in this HTTP standard that I want to get the root uh, page of dbin.at. And here the server responded and they said something like 302 found. And this is a common response, which is a redirect response because it said, yes, I have this resource, but it is actually on a different location. And the location is this one, HTTPS www.dbin.at. So here I already see that web content on dbin.at is already secured because if I try to access it on an unsecured channel, it redirects me to the secured channel. And But it also sends me actual HTML content. And you don't have to understand HTML, um, but you can already see that there is information you can just use. You, you can read the document or it's moved. Uh, it has moved somewhere to this address. And then there are a lot of funny text, the HTML text. But basically, that is what is sent over the internet. So exactly that characters basically in, in forms of bits and bytes are sent through all those nodes. And the same happens when I send emails over SMTP. If I don't explicitly use a, a, an encrypted channel, um, I just type into, into the, the SMTP connection or send to the server uh, something like, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm mail tantum IKT. I'm, I want to send mail from someone at tantum IKT. I want to send it to Jackie at dbin.at. Uh, and all the things between that's just the standard, how it is defined. I just have to know how that is, but that's uh, open knowledge. Um, and then I can type a message in there like, Hey, subject, check out this awesome prize you have just won. Just click on HTTP evil script or the example.org to claim your prize. And then in the end, the server says, okay, this message is queued. And at some point, the person that owns the address checkit will probably receive this message in their inbox, except there's a good spam filter. But that's how the mail system works. And this might give you some idea why spam is so pervasive. And I won't go into detail about encryption of emails. If we have time, if you still have nerves for that and want to know about more about that, we can go into that uh, after the talk or in the end. So that was quite a quite a bit. Uh, I hope uh, not all was new, but something was new for you. I now uh, would like to ask you some more questions be before we go into the, the securing part of all of this. So now we have a new Slido, um, and it's this number. I'll also post it in the chat. Uh, 
and then I'll start the first question. And now we have more open open questions like which digital communication channels do you use? And, and this is just basically the brainstorming of what what is there we usually use in our daily lives to communicate digitally, like email, messengers, and so on. Okay, Telegram is getting bigger, but Signal is still still the, the biggest one. It warms my heart, but we'll get to that later. Okay, there's already a lot of stuff here. Maybe wrap up if you quickly want to add one more thing that isn't here. Because I'll now go to the next uh, question, which is kind of similar. Now we had digital communication channel. Now the question is, um, oh, somebody's using RabbitMQ. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, like I always access uh, websites through 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 my shell with Telnet. Um, but now now let's go to the more secure way of communication. Which encrypted communication channels do you use? That might be the same that you provided before, but they also might not. I guess RabbitMQ wouldn't be encrypted in a standard setting. Okay, one important thing we already see, uh, uh, messengers are much bigger than before and, and all the most of the mail channels are, are not here, but some are like Posteo or Proton Mail. Uh, that's an important thing because by default, mail is not encrypted. Um, in the meantime, most mail servers might communicate over a secured channel between each other, but still the, the content of the of the transfer, the mail itself is not encrypted. And you never know, maybe some some mail server on the way might use an unencrypted connection. And then that would be a problem because the email would not be uh, encrypted like we have seen before in the example where he used Telnet to send an email. Um, 
And then there are some email providers uh, that allow you, probably in their web mail, to really encrypt the content of their email. So that is usually done with, with GPG or, or PGP or, uh, or S-MIME is even, a, is even another standard. Um, yeah, there, another one added post-Teo uh, with the question, is that encrypted? Well, not by default. Uh, if you send an email to somebody else who doesn't use encryption, then the email is not encrypted. But you can use, and, and I think Posteo provides that, you can use um, uh, GPG, for example, to actually encrypt the email. But that only works if you have the key of the other person who you want to encrypt it for. So email here is definitely a tricky one. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, email encryption like GPG is not very not very user friendly, let's say it that way again. It, it's quite secure, but it's not user friendly. And th that's always a problem in security when, when something is secure but not user friendly. In the end, it's often not really secure because uh, users don't use it as intended or don't understand it and don't use it at all and use something less secure. But let's come to the next question then. Uh, which kind of info did you ever send or post on the internet, uh, which you rather shouldn't have? And be as open as you like and as specific as you like or as unspecific as you like. I think things like that happen to all of us at some point that you send, you send something in an email or put it in a blog post or put it on Instagram or whatever you use on the internet and you had some kind of information there, uh, maybe it was the main information not, um, which you rather in retrospect uh, wouldn't have, should have sent. So far nothing. Yes, IBAN is a very common thing. Also, send it by mail. I'll often send IBAN by mail. It's not the ideal thing, but Yes, one, one, one thing with the internet also is that the internet never forgets, unfortunately. Um, you can make it forget in some cases, but uh, you, there's no guarantee. So also the thing with posting content, sometimes it's adequate to post something in a certain context, in a certain time, but at some point, 10 years later, it might be inadequate and it's still there and you don't have the guarantee that it's, you, you can make the internet or the service or whatever, wherever the information lands at that point uh, can forget. But there's also discussion about legislature um, that allows you to, do, or a discussion about the right uh, uh, for, forgetfulness, for example, in the internet. Yeah, let's let's leave it at that. I will come back to what what else you could post and you shouldn't or sometimes we are also not aware about what we're posting. Everything that can be traceable back to me, identify me as an individual. Yes, sometimes you want that and sometimes you really don't want that. And sometimes you're not aware at the time of posting that in, for example, the picture, there is something that that might be able to identify you or trace back to you, which you didn't consider at the time of posting. But I, now I have a final question. This this is probably for the nerds who use RabbitMQ and SFTP to communicate, but also for any curious mind, maybe. What does this mean? Ryub Eptev. And, and I give you one hint. Um, 
it's easier to pick out if you have a German keyboard layout. And it's not an important question, but it's just here to, for me to have a sort of mental break and to prepare for the next part. And, and maybe somebody finds a solution to that problem. With Google or without Google? <laughs> you can use Google if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried Dr. Go, it didn't help me. It's it's not a common password. Them, I, I will also try to answer with at least one question. Valea, why don't uh, massive providers like Google or Microsoft don't include a PHP or similar by default? Isn't it better for everyone? It depends. Um, it certainly would be better for us if we could easily encrypt uh, every everything we communicate. And uh, but the other thing, it's also not that easy. Um, I mean, we could say probably Google or Microsoft is big enough. It shouldn't be be hard for them to do to implement it. I cannot really answer that question. I suppose if they really wanted it, uh, it wouldn't be a problem because smaller providers also uh, are able to do it. Now somebody got it. Hello world. Whoever provided this, uh, kudos to you. <laughs> That's a Riop Eptev. This is basically a, a very simple ciphertext. So this is Hello World encrypted uh, with an algorithm that goes like this. Whatever you type, just take the next uh, one, one key to the right on the keyboard. Then you, when you want to type Hello World, you get uh, Riop Eptev. Um, that's a basic form of encryption. Of course, the uh, encryption we use uh, hopefully is the better one uh, and, and not that easy to break. So just shortly on the question of, of, of GPG as a default, first of all, it's not quite that easy also for users to actually understand when I'm encrypting, but there are already projects out there. Um, Another thing why, for example, a provider might not be that interested in, in encrypting everything or providing you encryption for everything, because then they cannot um, analyze the data because it's, you have encrypted it and they cannot really access the data, depending on how the encryption is done. And this might be for why would they want to have access, for example, to, to tailor advertising to whatever you write in an email, that would be the bad thing. But it wouldn't have to be a bad thing to analyze the content because you also could use it to, to search. If you want to search your emails, um, of course, the server would have to be able to search to, through the plain text of the emails. And if you encrypt everything, that wouldn't be possible. So comfort and security are always uh, some or sometimes or mostly uh, uh, um, conflicting requirements. Um, if something is very uncomfortable, but very secure, it will not do what you want with it, uh, because people will, won't use it in the right way. Uh, if it's very comfortable and not secure at all, well, people will use it uh, throughout the world, everywhere, uh, without any second thought, except some privacy aware people. Um, but well, then, then actually, all kinds of things could happen with the information. Yeah, so th thanks for, for your participation in, in, in this. I'll switch back to the slides to come to the 
secure communication chapter. Um, and here it's all about encryption. And there are two important kinds of encryption uh, we have to use or our computers will use. Uh, the first one is transport encryption and the other is end-to-end -end encryption. Um, transport encryption basically is the S in HTTPS. Um, also, for example, in IMAP S, which is the secure version of IMAP to retrieve mails. Um, and you're using it if you are accessing uh, and browsing websites uh, that are transmitted through the HTTPS protocol. And the S stands for secure, but also because it's using the secure sockets layer or uh, transport layer security protocols, um, which our computers use to actually exchange keys and encrypt things. So only that the, the recipient and, and the sender, which is my computer, uh, actually know the content. All others will will only um, see Reup Eptev or hopefully something better than Reup Eptev. Um, but uh, that's the idea of encryption that whoever reads the text in between only sees some cipher text that cannot be figured out if the encryption is good. Um, so the thing here is if I access a website and for example, I have to log in. So I have to provide my username and password to the server. Uh, I type into the web form my username and my password. Uh, and this then has to be transmitted, as we've seen before, somehow to the server. And I'm using HTTP, so I'm just sending plain text. Uh, and everyone, everybody who is here could read and log this information. They shouldn't, but they could. Um, and that's why we use HTTPS. Uh, what changes? Well, my browser already, uh, or the, the TLS layer in, in my computer already uh, encrypts everything. First, first it exchanges with the server some keys so that only the server and the browser are able to encrypt it and decrypt it and then send it over the network. So here, all those nodes will see Reup or whatever the cipher text is and won't be able to do anything uh, useful with it. And only the server can decipher it. And the same happens when the response is sent. So basically, that's transport security. So security, um, um, so that from wherever the packet is transported, it is encrypted. But in the end, it can be deciphered, or it has to be able to be deciphered. Otherwise, the server wouldn't know how to respond. What is still important here is uh, the authenticity, uh, authenticity of the server, uh, because there's, there are cases where, where I could be sent to different server, for example. So the server has a different IP address and just says, yes, of course, I have the website for dbin.it or whatever, and so sends back something. And you want to make sure that the server that responds really belongs to the person or to the organization um, that actually uh, has this website. And that's what we use uh, uh, TLS certificates for. And there are certain certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt, which are organizations that ensure that, that if I have the server, uh, that I get a certificate and they, they um, guarantee this is, that the certificate is valid and it tells you, the user, that the connection is secured and also verified by a certificate authority. So this authority uh, verifies that the server that is uh, that I have access actually belongs to to this organization. We have don't have to go into detail about it. It's just important to to know you always in your browsers usually you can click on the symbol and you see that it is secured and also get the information um, which organization. Uh, actually tells me that it is that it is secure. Uh, here just some screenshots about the difference between HTTP and HTTPS. You probably know that. Uh, here this is a standard HTTP connection. So here we have the I think this was made with uh, Firefox. So you have the, the lock uh, with the red line through it and here you have the, the closed lock. So this is a secured communication. That's the way the browser tells you okay you are safe and additionally, as we've seen before, you can click on it and it also tells you who actually does tell you that you're safe because you the server actually belongs to this organization. 
So the different kind of encryption is end-to-end -end encryption or a different kind of encryption. And this is especially important when you're not communicating directly, but by a third party, which is usually the case when you're using email or chat or messenger apps. Um, and I'll tell you what that exactly means uh, uh, based on this example. For example, I, I have a phone and I have a messenger and there's this the server of the messaging service and this service responsible for sending the message to the phone of, of person X, which I wanted to send the message whenever person X is online again or the phone of person X, because at the point when I'm sending, the person might not have an internet connection. So the server has to store the thing until the person can receive it. Okay, and, and in between there are a lot of, of routers and network nodes uh, as we've seen before. So if I use no encryption, I send hello, uh, hello in this case. And on every node and at the server, everybody could read hello. So this would be HTTP. If I use HTTPS, for example, uh, I of course can read hello and the server also can read it, but whoever is in between there cannot read anything because uh, it's uh, reaptive or some other side of text. And also on the way from the server to the to re recipient, everything is encrypted. But still, the server has to read it or can read it in this case, um, because only the transport between the, the relevant parties is secured. And the server somehow is relevant uh, because this phone should receive the message even if it is offline at the time when I'm posting it. And this is where end-to-end -end encryption comes in. End-to-end -end encryption guarantees us that only my device and the device of the recipient can actually read the content of the message. Um, so the server um, cannot read the content. The server still has to be able to read, okay, I get a message from somebody and I have to send the message to somebody. Otherwise, the server couldn't be able to trans uh, transmit the message whenever this phone comes online. So the server has some information, but not the information about the content. And that's what end-to-end -end encryption is. And that happens when you're using messengers uh, or when you send emails, because the emails are also somebody somehow stored on a server. Uh, and obviously, whenever it is possible, we would probably prefer end-to-end -end encryption, because actually the server doesn't need to know what the content is. So how to protect the data then? Um, we have talked about securing everything, encrypting everything uh, in the communication, but any secure software and any secure communication channel are of no use if I don't take care to handle information safely. And it was the thing with posting stuff online that I probably later regret that I posted. Um, but also it includes using my tools in a way that is more security aware or more privacy uh, enabled. And two important terms are, first of all, metadata. Metadata is, is, is basically the thing that the server needs to know, for example, to, how, to whom it has to transmit it without knowing the content. So, and metadata is important because even without the content of a message, it can be interesting to know who talks to whom and when and for how long and where did they talk to the person. And this all is metadata. And why could it be interesting or problematic? For example, there's this example of SMS chains before demonstrations. A lot of people go to a demonstration and this is especially bad in, in authoritarian regimes. Uh, and and the state only knows uh, one person who has been definitely there, but just before the event, there have been there a lot of SMS, for example, have been sent on messages, and I don't know even the content of the messages, but I know, don't know that it was just before the event, and there was usually high traffic. So I just have to connect all, the, all those people who have been connected to the one person I know that was there, and I can assume that a lot of those people have been there as well. So that is how metadata could be used in a bad way. Another example is after being on the phone with a medical laboratory, I, I just go to my computer and visit the website on how to deal with COVID-19. So 
maybe I would not want to know want anyone to know the metadata of my communication here because I mean that could mean anything but for example for an insurance company or I don't know it would they could interpret it in a way that is neither true nor in, in my interest and that could be possible without knowing the content of the, the communication but just knowing the metadata. Final example is the headers of the encrypted emails. We didn't go into that, um, but basically it's also uh, who sent what to whom uh, without knowing the what, but I still know who communicated with whom over which channels. Another important term is tracking. And this is a nice uh, uh, comic about how or what it's uh, like when you read a newspaper, you know, at home, probably looks something like that. Or you're alone, you have a glass of wine, you read the paper. But when you read news online, it more looks like that. You might not see that it looks like that, but usually there are a lot of stakeholders involved when you, you, when you access a news uh, website. There are uh, people from an ad network, there might be the NSA involved, uh, Amazon, of course, always, Facebook, and so on. So a lot of stakeholders that are involved, also your internet service provider who necessarily has to see all the packets that you send uh, and, and the communication and at least has the metadata. And it depends on, on, on if they misuse the data or not, so you somehow have to trust them. But how does it actually work? Um, and this is the last uh, last last sketch technical sketch and example how does tracking work well i first of all want to access the awesome news blog just some random blog uh, with some awesome news and as we know my web browser first has to send a request to the awesome news blog web server uh, it does that well it's no problem the new the server says the awesome news blog yes of course i have that it sends back the the response so, and the response looks like something like this. It's an HTML page, um, but the awesome news blog also has a lot of fancy features like pictures and the Facebook like button, for example. Uh, and for the Facebook like button to work, we have to load a picture and maybe also a script. And, uh, and the awesome news blog just says, uh, okay, Facebook, of course, has the like picture, so it doesn't have to be included directly from the server. So just go here and get it from here. And the browser does it for us automatically because the browser wants us to have a convenient web experience. I, I don't, do not want usually want to click on every picture. Yes, load this one and yes, load this one. I just want to have the awesome news blog and get the text and all the pictures. So what the browser does, it makes another request. This is the three to this server here, facebook.com. And the server here says, well, the like, pic the like button picture, yes, of course I have that, and response, as usual. And then the, when the web browser has everything, it displays a very nicely looking uh, awesome news blog page to us. And that's not really a problem. That's, that's basically the technical nature of, of uh, websites of HTML and hypertext. That's the idea. The problem is that here the server, or the problem could be, that this server, let's say in this case, facebook.com, has to write some server logs. Usually web servers do that. It's a technical thing. It just uh, notes down in a, in a log file when which IP address has requested what, and maybe also the referrer. The referrer is uh, the website that actually referred to this resource. Like in this case, when my browser has loaded already a something and only a part of that referred to this resource. And that's, that's not really a bad thing. That basically every web server does that to store also the referrer if it gets that from a web browser. That's just a, a technical convention. Um, the thing is only what, what does the server, the company behind it do with that information? Because now Facebook knows um, without my intention that I have visited the awesome news blog at this point in time because I wanted to get the like button uh, and this referral, referral was here. And that's the basic uh, principle of tracking. So 
and it is used a lot for for especially for advertisements um, and any other other things and it doesn't have to always be bad per se um, but sometimes you might not want to have that you might not want some company like Facebook know that you visited some blog because actually it doesn't have to do anything with each other um, and I will provide you uh, some tips uh, shortly how to prevent that uh, oh yeah here I just have the, the graphics in more detail so one more thing about about privacy the important thing is what you deliberately post on the internet because even if I prevent tracking and everything and we've already had that question you could post private pictures in a semi-private context uh, you could post different kind of information different on different blogs maybe you writing you're writing three different blogs and you have different audiences but by connecting the information that is on the different blogs and there might readers might get a fuller picture of you and that could be intended and it could not be intended and the same thing is with using the same alias over and over again it might not be a problem for you but it might uh, what usually always is a problem if you have password in pictures like you have a selfie and you have a whiteboard in the back and there is some password for some computer on your network that's usually always a problem there's seldom any reason you want it except you're a security researcher and want you set up a honeypot and you want some some people find that and and try to hack you so it's always important to be aware and there I also included that because I want to say that there is no guarantee of 100% security or privacy. It's always a relational thing. You always have to think about how much security do I need under my circumstances and what does it mean for when I post, thing, post things on the internet. Um, now I would have a last section which is short, but I'm not sure if we should already go into the final tips and tricks. Uh, which will be short. Um, maybe you can just give me a thumbs up if you want to continue a little bit more, like five minutes more, or if you would really come want to come to an end already, uh, give me a thumbs down in the chat. Yes, I interpreted it as a thumbs up to do five minutes more. I also saw some thumbs up there's reaction here, so I guess you can go on. <laughs> okay, so we already talked about trust a little bit. For example, I have to trust my internet service provider that it doesn't do anything not so ethical, let's say, with my metadata, for example, even if I use uh, all, all the time only encrypted uh, communication channels. In the end, um, even if I'm a security researcher, I will never have uh, all the time I would need to to validate actually that the algorithms that are used for encrypting are the most uh, secure ones, or they are that they are not already hacked, or that, uh, that the servers I communicate with um, have a proper setup. So in the end, you always have to trust somebody when you're communicating on the internet, and. A few important aspects here are, um, first of all, if I use a service or visit some website or whatever, uh, the important thing is what organization is behind the software or the service um, and what is the business model. The, the prominent example is the thing between Google and Apple. Everybody knows that Google is making money with ads. Uh, so they provide they are providing services for free to get data they can use to to increase their ad revenue. While Apple is very expensive, uh, but many people trust more that Apple wouldn't do anything unethical, let's say, with their data because they're already making good money by by selling things to people who have enough money to buy them. And so this is always a, a question you you can ask yourself and you can find an answer and, and you might say, okay, it's in this case, it's fine for me. Or in this case, I would like to have a different, or look for different services. Sometimes, often there are different uh, uh, options available. Sometimes there aren't. Uh, another important thing is, uh, is a software proprietary or open source? 
Um, here again, sometimes uh, you have to use very special software that is only available for proprietary. Then you have to trust that the company that provides you the software is doing a really good, uh, has a really good development um, cycle that includes also security analysis. Um, and you have to trust that the code is, is secure and good. With open source software, you could either look yourself into the code. Most of us don't do that. I also don't do that. Um, because it's time intensive, but the important thing with open source is that there's a whole huge community of, of security researchers and developers um, who overall have enough time to look into those things and to find vulnerabilities, and then those vulnerabilities also can get fixed quickly. Another thing is who hosts the software and who operates the server? Um, for example, with let's say Google Docs, it's quite clear. Well, Google does and nobody else. But there are open source alternatives, for example, uh, Nextcloud for file storage. Then you still have the question, who hosts the, this specific uh, cloud service or this specific Nextcloud instance and who operates it? And what is their model to make money or to at least pay for what they need to, uh, to provide the service? And we already talked about messengers a bit. Uh, probably you all know that WhatsApp uh, is is, a, is part of the Facebook network since 2014. Before it was a standalone app with the, with an own company behind it, but Facebook bought it in 2014, and it's getting more and more problematic. In the end, I have a, a, a have a link for you a suggestion uh, that explains a bit more about that in a very um, uh, amusing way. Then there's Telegram. Many people think Telegram is a, a, a good, a privacy-wise, good alternative to WhatsApp. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, Telegram is a private company that was founded by Pavel Durov, one of the Vikontakte founders. Vikontakte is a social network, or was originally a Russian-based social network. Um, and you probably wouldn't have to worry about the Russian state with Telegram, but in the end, Telegram has a Although it, meanwhile, has a lot of its source open sourced, uh, it still uses a proprietary uh, security algorithm. It doesn't have end-to-end -end encryption by default. You can enable it. Uh, and it has a lot of probably dubious practices. But I also will really refer to this one reference in the end where you get more info about that. And then there's Signal. Uh, Signal is uh, developed by Open Whisper Systems. Uh, which is or was primarily supported by the Open Technology Fund, which is an US State Department. But the thing is, it's a, an independent nonprofit organization, um, and it is developed as a free and uh, deeper and open source software, so everybody can look into the code. And it really has a good uh, algorithm for end-to-end -end encryption. And the algorithm is so good that uh, WhatsApp actually two or three years ago I think switched to this algorithm. So WhatsApp is using the same algorithm with Signal, which makes the end-to-end -end encryption uh, as good as Signal. The problem with WhatsApp is a different one that all the metadata is used for other things and for example, your phone contacts and so on. And then of course, there are also a lot of other messengers. If you want to have a very privacy aware ways of communication, I would suggest Signal. There are others, and I have a link in the end, given more examples. When it comes to shared documents, um, probably everybody knows Google Docs, which is, of course, owned by Google, and it's very usable, but probably also very problematic in terms of data protection. Uh, and that this is probably the case with all services that are US-based, because they they don't have to follow the, whole, the same standards. I mean, there are workarounds and uh, privacy shield safe harbor and so and so other. There is a lot of legal work trying to make sure that also US services have to adhere to the same um, data protection standards we have in the EU. Um, but in the end, it still stays problematic in a way. And there are alternatives, like I've mentioned, Nextcloud, which is an open source file cloud. With in, in the meantime, many other applications like LibreOffice Online, so you could do the same thing like, like with Google, Google Docs. Um, you also have talks and polls and forums and so on. And here's just one example when you follow the link. Uh, this is Teamly Cloud, they provide a Nextcloud for, 
for emancipatory initiatives, for example, but there are many different providers of Nextcloud. So this, this is open source and you can find the organization that you trust most uh, with hosting your files. Uh, another thing is Etherpad, an open source web-based collaborative editor. Um, here's again one example. Uh, and Cryptpad is a bit similar, but it's uh, it's also open source, but it's zero knowledge. It follows a zero knowledge approach. Um, and you can have uh, spreadsheets and rich text formatting and, and code pads and, and a lot of different things. Uh, and it's developed by Framasoft, which is a, a French-based um, cooperative, I think. And here are two examples of, of instances for Cryptpad. And this is very nice to quickly collaborate on, on documents. And the important thing why I included it is because of the zero knowledge approach. What does it mean? Zero knowledge uh, is an approach uh, that, that makes sure that even the server that hosts the information cannot read the information. So while, while many other services like Etherpad or Nextcloud or also Google don't encrypt the information on the server because by the programming logic of the software, it has to read the, the document to provide it to you. Zero knowledge applications uh, only encrypted in your in the browser and whatever is stored on the web server is encrypted in a way that only you can read it or only you and all those people you provide with the sharing link, for example. Yes, it was just a few examples of, uh, of, of applications and services you could use if you don't use them already to increase your privacy. Um, and now I still have some tips and advice what else you could do. Uh, for example, use a password manager like Keepas XC. This is available for Windows, Linux and Mac OS X. Um, the idea with password manager is that you only have to remember one very good password uh, because you use that to unlock your password manager and all the other passwords for all the websites, you don't have to remember because your password manager can remember them and they can be quite secure and you can use different passwords for all the different websites, which is very good practice. Or actually it would be a bad practice to keep the same password for many websites because if one website gets hacked and the password gets leaked some way, uh, all the other services could be taken over and uh, your identity could be uh, quite misused, be misused for whatever thing somebody wants to do with it. Uh, whenever you can activate two-factor authentication, it is less convenient, sometimes less convenient to use it, uh, but it's more secure. So it's a, a trade-off. Uh, you have to decide how important is this account. The general rule would be if you can enable it, enable it because in the end you're, the account you're using is more secure and also the, the ways two-factor authentication is implemented are they getting more and more usable and the more services that are using it, uh, the easier it will be for us to, to integrate it in our daily workflows. If you really want to be very uh, anonymous on the web, uh, you should use Tor and Tails. Tor is an, uh, basically an anonymization network um, and there's the Tor browser. It works like Firefox, actually it's based on Firefox, but it uses the Tor network so nobody really can, can track or follow the traffic through the network uh, when you request a website. And Tails is an operating system. It's a Linux-based system. You could put it on a USB stick. And when you start it, you can do whatever you want with it. And when you shut it down, it forgets everything, basically. That's why it's called the Amnesic Incognito Life System. But this is if you really want to be very secure. If you're, for example, working as a journalist in an authoritarian regime, it might be a good uh, idea to use those, for example. For more daily and every person's use, uh, there are a few things like HTTPS everywhere. There are browser plugins. I think they work in Firefox and Chromium at least. Uh, and the Privacy Badger and uBlock Origin. And they help you to 
ideally always use secure communication channels and also to block to block un unnecessary tracking scripts and so on. Um, with uBlock Origin, it, it blocks a lot, but it, for example, it wouldn't block the Facebook like button, but you can, could configure it uh, to also do that. And that's very easy. You just go to the website, click on add the plugin to the web browser, and it's working. So that's quite easy ways to improve your privacy on the web. And here I'm already at my pre-final slide, uh, the more references. I will come back to that uh, shortly. Uh, I just want to close first uh, and say that I hopefully I have raised uh, some more questions and maybe I might be able to answer some. Uh, and again, the, the, the slides, I'll post it once more in the chat if you want to revisit this later. Uh, and you also find uh, my different contact channels if you want to ask me something later. Um, you're very welcome to ask your questions now in the chat or, or by ac activating your mic or video. I think we are supposed to do that now. Doris would have to tell us. And yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so any way you want uh, to ask things. And, and meanwhile, I will jump to this last slide, which is just some references I have. You could visit. Um, and I see I forgot one thing. I just had to do a quick rsync. And hopefully it's here. Yes. Um, this first thing is uh, on code.org. They have a video library with a section how the internet works. And actually it's tailored towards uh, high school education, but I think it, it's a thing for the whole family and also for other people. And I very much like the videos and it explains all the things like IP, DNS, routing, HTTP, HTML in a much more detailed way uh, than I, I have time now for explaining. And also it tells you in a nicely animated uh, way in short, less than 10 minute videos. And then there are also a lot of other uh, resources we can go into more detail about privacy, tracking, and so on. And when you want to know more about the history of the internet and the whole communications landscape, uh, there's one podcast I really can suggest. It's Command Line Heroes, which has uh, a lot of very, very nicely uh, made, uh, basically, history pieces on, on the development of programming languages, computers, networks, and so on. And a, a resource for all German speakers, which probably are a lot of you, uh, so many tabs, which is an awesome uh, YouTube channel I discovered recently uh, uh, with where four IT experts uh, explain all things digital uh, in a very hilariously amusing, but yet informative and succinct way. And for example, I just, watched, I think, yesterday a video on, on WhatsApp and, and messengers. And they also have a, a, a video on alternatives to WhatsApp where they mention a lot about Telegram and why it's not in, in their suggestions. But they also have, besides Signal, some other suggestions like Threema and I think Wire. And they also have like 10 minute videos you can watch in between. And it's it's funny and informative. So yes, now please hit me with some questions. Or tell me that it was all just too long and too fast. It, it's also a good <laughs> feedback. Today we have a shy audience, I guess. <laughs> you can all unmute yourself and ask your questions also directly, if you like. Yeah, and thank you for the feedback so far. And we only have uh, two questions. One 
is are the pop-up blockers also a good thing to use? Uh, well, it, it depends on which ones. Uh, I would say yes, they are, because pop-ups might be quite uh, annoying. So it, it, it depends on a use case, you know, but for me, I would say pop-up blocker is a, is a good thing. But also, like, I, I usually use Firefox. It already has that feature integrated. Uh, if a website does too many block pop-ups, it already blocks it automatically. So I don't actually have to. Good to it. know. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the other thing with plugins is also like like with the WordPress websites or anything that is quite popular and has a lot of plugins. Uh, every plugin is additional code that also might make your system more vulnerable. So if you install plugin, at least look at the plugin page and look if at least many people are using that. Because if, if it's a plugin that only are used that is used by a hundred people on, on the whole world, then it's probably not the wise choice to do to, to use it. Instead you really know what you do. Um, so with plugins I usually would opt only for those plugins that are really well supported and currently maintained and used by many people because um, that would be some kind of guarantee that the plugin is updated and, and security checked. And the other question was, how should I start protecting or encrypting my data as a starting organization? Um, the, the usual answer of security people, it depends. It depends on what your organization is and does, but I understand it as okay. I have an organization, and I start. I have to start to share documents and uh, and communicate somehow. That's usually the first thing. The first thing organizations use digital communications for. Um, then you would have to make sure that first of all, that for example, that the computers your members are using are secured. Because if you have a secure uh, web storage, if you have Nextcloud, and I think meanwhile Nextcloud also already can uh, can encrypt the data on the server. So you would have encrypted storage on your Nextcloud, which is a good thing. So you could use that uh, and the data would be secure. Even if the server would be hacked and, and the data got leaked, it still would be encrypted. Um, but the other thing is, if all your organization members are using very insecure devices, uh, the problem might be one of the insecure devices. If one of the devices gets hacked, uh, then the, the, the encryption of the next cloud does not bring any gain because through the encrypted devices, which of course should be able to access the data, um, depending on your organization model, uh, everything could be nevertheless read. So it really depends on what your what their security demands are basically, and also about the the, the budget you have and the, the the expertise you have and so on. So there are many concerns. Um, it's always good to have updated systems, or whatever. If people are using Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, or Android or iOS, make sure to always have updated uh, systems. That's one of the most important things. And then of course for file storage. Uh, something like Nextcloud could be a good choice, or any other uh, cloud storage that you uh, that that provides encryption. But of course, you could also for say, example oh, I Microsoft. I need to. I need uh, yeah, me as a Microsoft consultant. I need to say it. <laughs> so, so Microsoft also uh, uh, provides encryption of of data storage. Yeah, I I don't know that because I'm a Linux person. <laughs> <laughs> and. But then there's still you still even could say no I don't want to have anything in the cloud that also is an option. The problem is here what is the cloud? You could say okay I host my own server, but well then your own server is the cloud. Uh, the the thing with cloud is that the, the information is stored permanently accessible through over the internet, which is a good thing if you want to use this in this way. But of course it it might be vulnerable to, to getting hacked all the time. So you could also decide to only store common data on 
I don't know, on hard drives you exchange uh, physically uh, or on, on a very secured office network. So I, I guess there's no general answer to this question. Uh, I could try to answer it more specifically if you provide me some more context. Let's say it like that. Okay, that's also a good question. I'm using keypass, but sometimes I wonder that it might be even more dangerous than not using one because if someone hacks my own my my one master password for the key pass, they will know all the other passwords. What's your take on this using different key pass accounts? Mm, again, it depends. There's no clear answer, but yes, of course it's true. If somebody hacks your device, uh, your computer where you have key pass, and and maybe if they can can hack your key pass password, even if it's very good, of course they have access to all your other passwords. Uh, even if you don't know your KeePass password, if they can hack your computer and can install a keylogger, then you're also doomed, obviously. So there is some risk. The question is, the question is always which risk you have with different kinds of communication, different kinds of storage. The other option would be not to use KeePass and to remember our passwords. Okay, obviously that wouldn't be an option for most of us because we are using too many services. Then of course you could say, okay, I have different sets of passwords, like very unimportant passwords for unimportant services. This, that would be one approach. Or as you already mentioned, you could have different key pass accounts. I, for example, I use different password managers for different domains of things. I have one password manager this is that is really only on my device which i use for important stuff then i have a password manager that that stores it encrypted in the cloud for the not so important stuff in the end you have to figure out what your personal demands and what your personal strategies are and for example i don't uh, store any or i don't use password managers on my phone because I don't trust my phone and I don't trust myself to actually keep my phone secured enough. So I keep my phone stuff quite separate from my notebook stuff because I'm quite knowledgeable in securing my notebook but not really in securing my phone. That's for example one consideration. Yes, somebody mentioned the two-factor authentication. That's always a good good thing because uh, if you have two-factor uh, enabled, then whoever hacks your password, they also would need a second a second uh, a channel or a second uh, medium or the, the second means of authentication because the password alone uh, does not uh, authenticate you in in the two-factor authentication settings. Of course, if the second factor is just your email that is also on your on your computer and your computer is hacked, then it doesn't work. May I just ask something? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because I have an I have, the iPhone has its own um, key passwords and it uses your face ID to enter those passwords. So, do you think that's a safer version? Because I used Dashlane for some time, but um, it got on my nerves to always enter these master passwords and now I have um, with my iPhone I just have to um, put my face in front of the camera and then it just enters all the passwords. Do you think that's unsafe? I'm, I, I'm not really knowledgeable about um, about face recognition for, for, uh, for authentication. I didn't read up on that uh, a lot. Uh, in the end, I, I like like fingerprints and and other um, uh, how do you call it bio information that you have. Um, on the one hand, they are quite secure, but they, because they are quite unique, but also they are often quite easy workarounds. Uh, like with the fingerprints, it's quite easy to to get the print from somewhere, from a glass, uh, with very easy methods. Said. You, there are YouTube videos out there 
and to put it on the on the scanner and it, it already works. And with face recognition, I'm not sure how how well you could trick the face recognition just with a picture of the face. So I'm not really knowledgeable of, about that. Um, but uh, all biomarkers are usually tricky and probably not biometrics things. Um, probably not the best means. Probably good in a two-factor authentication setting again. But I wouldn't rely on them solely for, for a high security scenario. If I have a recommendation where to read or study encryption in a more human language, uh, Yes, I, I guess so. I'm always on the lookout for those myself. And there certainly are. I don't have, just don't have any anything ready now. Um, but if you want, maybe just send me an email and I will get back to you what, with whatever I find in, in, my, in my stacks of notes uh, that are distributed somewhere on my hard drive. But there's, for example, the one. Um, oh, by the way, do you see yourself now? I forgot that I shared. The, <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's, for example, the Survey and Self Defense website by the Electronic Frontier Foundation explains a lot of the things in, in a language that is uh, addressing a broader audience, let's say it like that. That it's not always the best thing, but they have a lot of articles explaining different aspects about encryption and and secure communication and, for example, what the certificates uh, I, I talked about are. Um, so this could be one resource, the surveillance self-defense. Um, but if you write me, I, I certainly can try to find other ones which are somewhere in my browser history, probably. Did I miss any of the questions? No, I think you got all. So I'll get back to the to the final slide again with the link, but I guess it's on the once more I'll post it in the chat. So I can unshare my desktop and move you into my view again. 